Hey yo guys, I'm back here to give you my thoughts on last night's TNA uh, Slammiversary 7 pay-per-view as well as uh, UFC's uh, uh, Ultimate Fighter Season 9 live finale which took place on Saturday night at the Pearl at the Palms. Uh, gotta say that the UFC show was actually really great. Um, you know, not just because of the Clay Guida versus Diego Sanchez fight, which was just an incredible uh, fight, but you know, he also got a really good fight in that Nate Diaz and uh, Joe Stevenson, as well as uh, Kevin Burns and Chris Lytle. So that's just uh, you know my quick overview, and that's just the main card. Really, the tough fights were actually kind of disappointing, uh, but or what they were. Um, anyways, we'll start with TNA, as that's just, this took place, uh, TNA's pay-per-view, Slammiversary uh, 7, took place last night from the Palace of Auburn Hills in Auburn Hills, Michigan. Gotta say, this show was, for TNA, their best pay-per-view put forward. Um, their bigger shows, like Slammiversary and Bound for Glory, they pull out all the stops. They, they do really good, you know, action and... Uh, their angles may be sometimes not the best things in the world. I think, you know, the angle at the end, it came out of nowhere. But I think it worked because it wasn't a typical TNA swerve where they set you up for something that you see a mile away or something that just makes no sense whatsoever. But with this one, it has some sense. To, uh, you didn't see it coming, but it worked. But I'll explain that as the uh, we get to the main event. Uh, we started things off with the King of the Mountain match with the X Division title. I uh, didn't see the pre-show match. I should say that I heard it was really nothing. It was basic. I heard basically it was Eric Young being heelish and walking out. It was the British Invasion against Rhino, and then the Rhino student came out, hot tag, and then he got pinned. That was the match. So this Jesse, the Navy Seal guy or whatever his name is, looks like a complete douche uh, from TNA. But anyways. We started things off with the X Division uh, King of the Mountain match. Really good match. Um, maybe a bit too spotty and maybe a bit too long. Uh, it went. That's just my thoughts on the match. Really, um, it kind of may seem to a fan that it was kind of dumb that you had two tag teams who were working together to defeat Suicide in this match. So that's just my thoughts on it. This was, like I said, it was maybe a bit too spotty, but then again, it's a spot fest match. There were some real crazy spots in there. I mean, Jay Lethal, Jay Lethal was in most of them. I mean, he did an L up to, I believe, Alex Shelley, who was on a ladder that was on the ring apron and a guardrail. And, you know, when you see that spot in WWE, the, the ladder breaks. And, you know, it makes it look more spectacular. And, you know, it's a lot less painful. Here in TNA, it was just ladder no give. And that was that. Um, but the more memorable spot in this match to me was with Jay Lethal being on the uh, a ladder that was posted on the top rope and the ring post, and he got catapulted off there, and he really didn't know what to do. Like, he thought, well, maybe I should just go and lie on my stomach, but he decided to tuck, and he tucked at the last minute, and thankfully he did, because if not, he'd have landed right on his head. And that wouldn't have been good considering, you know, what we know about uh, wrestlers landing on their head just over the last week, you know, with the unfortunate death of Mitsuhara Masawa. So that's something I really didn't need to see another wrestler falling on his head and, you know, maybe unfortunately dying or be seriously hurt. Um, but we didn't get that with Jay, which is a good thing. So then, you know, the match progressed and, you know, there were some cool spots, like I said, but maybe it was a bit too spotty. Uh, the crowd really wasn't suicide at all towards the end when he was obviously going to be the one to uh, put up the X Division title. So that was that match. Uh, it, it was good. Definitely, you know, uh, these are the type of guys, especially the guns and con lethal consequences are the ones that you uh, want to have uh, be in your opening match. I think they just have some of the best chemistry going today. And it, it worked out well. And, you know, it gets to, you know, the feud will obviously progress. You know, it's actually one of the better feuds they've had in the X Division. Uh, I may be getting a little foolish. I mean, they may actually have to start getting the unmasking, or the two teams are going to have to clash again and just so have some single, separate tag matches between them, but this was a good match and a good way to get the crowd uh, going, especially with the uh, two guys from uh, Detroit and the Motor City Machine Guns. Then we went to the next match. This was Daniels versus Shane Douglas, and, you know, 
we all knew going in this match wouldn't be good, and unfortunately for Shane Douglas, you know, him, he hurt his ankle early into the match, and that just, you know, if there was a doubt in your mind that, you know, a slight hope that it could have been good, it was just shot with that. So, you know, this match was really nothing. You know, Daniel, uh, Douglas came back really not in the best shape. Um, you know, and the fact that, you know, his timing looked way off, and that could be from, you know, not being active enough in the ring, and the injury hurt him a little bit. So, that's just my thoughts on that aspect of it. It was just unfortunate. I mean, look, I mean, he, hit, he couldn't even hit the ropes properly. Um, and then Daniels got the win with a STO BME combination. And, you know, it's not a big win for Daniels, but, you know, it made him important. And it looks like that's going to be the end of Shane Douglas as an in-ring performer in TNA. I don't know if he even stick around in TNA, but if TNA continues to use him, uh, I think he would be best suited as a manager, like what he was doing with the Naturals, only hopefully, that you know, they... They book it right where, you know, they push him. Hell, they could, you know, give Cody Deaner, be Cody Deaner's mouthpiece or something. I, I don't know. Uh, then we went to the match, and this was a match I probably overhyped for myself and a few other people who I talked to about this match. It was the TNA Knockout Championship match, Angelina Love defending against Tara, a.k.a. Victoria. This match was not as good as you thought it could be because... When Victoria came in, or I should say Tara, when she came in, she had this superstar reaction, you know, Angelina Love gave this great facial, and, you know, they had this awesome stare-down, beat-down moment, or a conflict, I should say, not a beat-down, um, that, you know, the crowd got into it. It was a superstar reaction. The whole build was, like, this is a really important program, probably the best thing that the knockout division's had in quite some time. But the match didn't flow that way. I mean, I may have over-hyped up um, Love's in-ring, I mean, she's better than most give her credit for, but she hasn't been showing it as of late. So that was that match, and I mean, it was just kind of the same bullshit uh, finish where, you know, you, need to, you, you knew this match had to be a cheap heat victory for the heel because, you know, you can't give Tara the belt right away. It just makes her look stupid, and it kind of is your belt if someone can easily win it that quickly. And then what else can she do like, on her first big match? Why else does she really need to be in the company after she loses? Uh, but, you know, it was the hairspray to the eyes, and that to me was, you know, it's a fine finish, but you did it on your last pay-per-view. Come up with something else cre creative, and I mean, with the beautiful people being the beautiful people, you can, because, you know, a purse or something of that nature. Uh, not the same finish we got against Kong, so that's just my thoughts there. And, you know, they didn't give this one that much time. I thought they could have maybe given it maybe two minutes more, but... Whatever, I mean, considering, uh, you know, at least she, you know, Love didn't kick out of, you know, the Widow Speaker or anything like that, but it was a good match, so, I'm not a, actually, blah, what am I talking about? It was a match that definitely could have been better, but, uh, something just lacked, but obviously the feud continues, and, you know, hopefully these two get, you know, their timing down better. Then we go to the next match, which was the first ever mixed tag Monsters Ball, it was Raven and Daphne versus Abyss and Taylor Wilde. Got to say a couple things about this match. This was the best I've seen Taylor Wilde in TNA since she came into the company. Um, she definitely got forced down our throats all last year because, you know, she beat Kong, who people didn't buy that at all. She beat her for the belt, people didn't buy that at all. And, you know, the push really was too much for someone that quick into the company. Um, but here, she, you know, she's gelled in. You know, she's actually been getting, you know, she's been really better in the ring as of late. Um... And then here, she, her and Daphne have this good chemistry. And I think the thing is that it wasn't just them having a Monsters Ball match. You had, you know, Abyss, who, yeah, he's been booked the exact same way since 2007 in these plunder-type matches. But he's in there with someone like Raven, who knows how to work these type matches. And plus, him and uh, Raven have this really good chemistry. And that just added to the chemistry that Daphne and Taylor Wilde have. Because they had some pretty good singles matches as well you know, with the hardcore, really didn't work, and I didn't, I don't think Taylor really knew what to do in there, I think that was her first environment, first time being in that environment, but this one, I will say, you also got to give uh, Daphne some credit, because Daphne took four mean looking bumps, or spots, or whatever you want to say, I mean, first she got squished in the corner by Abyss, which was, you know, that's just not got to be fun, then, you know, when uh, Abyss was chasing Raven over the guardrail, Daphne hopped on his back, and Abyss just, like, chucked her off. And when she fell back, she hit the back of her head right on the steps. And that's just, that didn't look good at all. I mean, that's probably an instant concussion right there. 
Then, of course, there was the big, well, the second big spot for the knockouts. It was uh, Daphne getting set up on a table in a bit. Taylor Wilde doing a splash off the speakers um, through the table. She more fell off than jumping off and doing a splash, but whatever. It looked nice, and, you know, it looked safe for a, a spot like that, you know, clean, cleanly, you know, connecting with the body, and the table broke cleanly. And then, of course, the big one where she went in the tax, and, you know, I'm not a big tax spots. I mean, it got a nice reaction. I don't know if she really needed to do that spot since she did the, the knockouts did their big spot, but whatever, you know, she needs to be given credit for doing that. And then I guess Raven probably earned himself a job in TNA because this was the best, you know, he looked in the ring because when he was at last in TNA back in late 2007, he had a big thyroid injury and he gained a lot of weight and he couldn't lose the weight because of this problem. Now that, you know, he's back in TNA, he's got cleared up the injury, first of all, so he's lost some weight, he was be able to be more mobile and such, so that's a big positive there. And, you know, I thought that the finish of this match was good after, you know, Daphne went in the tax, it looked like, oh, the heels are going to get their victory, uh, because, you know, Dr. Steve with the but then Abyss came, and Black Hole slammed Raven into the tax for the win. A much better match than you thought it would be, especially with Abyss in another plunder match when we've seen these him in these type of matches basically since 2007, look the exact same way, um, so... <laughs> That's just my thoughts on that, uh, that aspect of Abyss's character, but it, much better match than you'd think it would be. Then we went to Sting versus Matt Morgan. You know what, St I will say something, Sting tried. I mean, he did some things that he really didn't do. He wouldn't do with, you know, anyone else. I mean, he threw a missile dropkick. You know, for, for him at being 50 years old, that's impressive. Um, you know, Morgan worked like a big man, which is a good, strong thing for him, because that's what he needs to do. Uh, but really, you know, no one really believed he would win, considering it was Sting and this wasn't the main event. You know, Sting tried, but he didn't try as much as you think he could. Um, what else was I going to make mention of in this note? I mean, in this match, they, they changed the stipulation because it was supposed to be if Morgan won, he'd take Sting's spot in the main event Mafia, but they just changed it to if he beat Sting, he'd be in the Mafia. Um, but I, one thing I have to say, I liked that, you know, with Sting being the veteran, they probably, they worked out this nice finish because Sting hit the Scorpion Death Drop on Morgan, didn't get the finish, and then he climbed, he went up to the second turnbuckle, or second rope, and delivered it and got the win there. You know, it made sense. i got to say that that part of it made sense. So I like the finish in this one. Match, and it wasn't the best thing, but, you know, Sting tried some stuff there, so... Uh, that's just my thoughts there. Then we went to the next match. This was Team 3D versus Beer Money Incorporated. They tag team titles. Um, the big angle in this one was, actually uh, throughout the whole show, was was Team 3D going to make it to the event? Because, you know, they worked the New Japan uh, show Saturday night, I guess. So over, over here, like late, early Sunday, um, where Team 3D defended the IWGP belts against uh, Carl the Machine and Giant Bernard in a match that was pretty good. But anyways, this match was like this match was pretty good as well. Um, Beer Money and, and uh, Team 3D have this really good chemistry going. Um, this definitely wasn't the best Beer Money match uh, we've seen in the last three pay-per-views, but still it was good. And the thing I liked, you know, the thing I heard it maybe a little bit was the British Invasion coming down and doing some commentary. But it's obviously to set up the fact this is now going to be a three-way program. And, you know, with the beer, with uh, British Invasion coming down, it gave them maybe the match a little bit more time than it could have needed. But that's just me saying um, my opinion on that. Uh, really, then the finish was the British Invasion got involved and Team 3D knocked them down. And everybody hit uh, drinking while investing for the win. And I think it was smart for TNA to put the belts on Beer Money because Beer Money is the most overact in the tag division best working team in the tag division, so may as well put on the, the most over team and best working team in your tag division that you can get a lot of matches out of a lot of teams with, more so than Team 3D, so big positive there, and obviously this will be a three-way program, uh, Beer Money, Team 3D, and the Inva British Invasion, much similar to the program that WCW used to uh, had with uh, Harlem Heat, Team 3D, and the Blue Bloods were, or excuse me, the Nasty Boys, and uh, the Blue Bloods, where basically it was a program between the Harlem Heat and the uh, Nasty Boys that just threw the Blue Bloods in uh, to help Harlem Heat, and then 
laws happen between them. Basically the same things happening here, so that's actually going to be a good little program. Then we went to the main event, which was uh, the King of the Mountain match for the TNA Heavyweight Championship. It was Mick Foley defending his belt against Jeff Jarrett, Kurt Angle, AJ Styles, and Samoa Joe. And by the way, Kurt Angle sporting a new do, you know, for a movie. Made him look like Randy the Natural Couture. So, interesting note there. Um, I've got to say a thing about this match, you know. One thing that TNA has to do with these multi-man matches when it's your main event, don't waste the last 20 minutes you have going into it. Like, it was 10 o'clock when they announced this match, and they wasted 20 to 25 minutes on just, you know, shooting them at the back, video package, entrance, and then formal introductions at them. Wasted a lot of time there. You could have just had your match, you know, and ended it, you know, the pay-per-view, not having to worry about going over your time limit on pay-per-view. You know, they cut this thing right to 11, like just two minutes before their feed would have been cut short. So, just something I want to make note here. But like I said, I think this match was a better match than the X Division one. The X Division one, while good, you got the impression it was more, let's just go from this spot to the next uh, let's take the crowd down and build up to our next spot. This one was more, let's build up a match to tell a story and have, uh, you know, rhyme and reason why we're doing some stuff. So that's just my opinion on it. Uh, I, I like this match. Um, I gotta say, you know, Joe for being an injured man, he, this is the best we've seen Joe work <laughs> since this new Nation of Violence gimmick has been uh, thrown at him. Um, he was doing stuff we haven't, I haven't seen Joe do in a while, like his tope through the rope. Uh, there was some pretty interesting and, you know, mean looking spots. I mean, when Joe went to climb the uh, the ladder and, you know, I think AJ knocked it out and Joe's lower back hit the frickin' end of one of the bottom of the ladders and that just looked mean. Um, I mean, I believe AJ gave a suplex on the ladder and, like, just some a lot of stuff that you're like, man, maybe these some of these guys shouldn't be taking stuff in there. Uh, they did this one cool spot where Angle hit an Olympic slam on Jarrett and then Foley came off the penalty box and delivered an elbow drop. Uh, there was like two separate stories in this match. There was the one with Joe hating Angle and wanting to kill him. And then there was the spot, the thing where Mick Foley didn't really want to defend his belt and he tried to hide out in the penalty box. But really when you think about it, why would, you know, if you're the champion, you really don't want to be in there. So that's just my thoughts on that. Um... And then, you know, with the finish, I thought it was nice because it was actually Joe and AJ working in there more so than anything, um, which is a good thing. And the, I'm happy that TNA gave them the chance to do it. Don't know how long we'll continue with it, but they, they did there. You could definitely tell the crowd wanted AJ to win. Um, AJ definitely looks like he probably should get the belt, but yeah, won't because, one, he has the um, Legends belt, and, two, this company is treating him like he's a new guy when he's been there for all seven years, so... That's just my opinion on that. And then, of course, the finish was that after AJ was dumped, uh, Joe went to climb up with the belt. Angle made the cutoff, but then Joe just gave him the belt. So, nice swerve in there that, you know, no one saw coming. But, you know, it, it worked to me because it has a nice, you know, rhyme or reason. Was we all thought that Joe's mentor was Taz, and it turns out it's Kurt Angle. And then, you know, with him beating, you know, Steiner, Booker, and Nash so badly on pay-per-view, they're like, look, those are your initiations, and you beat them so badly that, you know, you're easily main event ma material, so now you're in the Mafia. That's with Angle being the mentor since, you know, their history that they've had in TNA, so that was something I thought was good. The uh, only gripe I can really have on this match was Keith Mitchell and the production crew shooting this match. I mean, when AJ pinned Foley to become eligible, they completely missed it, and in a match like this, you really need to be there for every pinfall, so, you know, that's the only gripe I'm going to have on that, but overall, really good show. Uh, I don't know if you go out of your way to see it, but, you know, if you, the matches I definitely recommend you, you know, find, you know, definitely just to see the swerve uh, at the end and the match, the two King of the Mountain matches, and, you know, to see a fun uh, Monsters Ball match. Uh, moving on to the UFC show, like I said, this is a really great show. Uh, undercard was absolutely nothing of note, uh, other than, you know, two, um, decisions that I didn't think should have gone the way that they did. A lot of people are all, all the Melvin Gillard uh, decision, that's just total highway robbery. I, to an extent, see where you're coming from, but in my opinion, round two was Gillard, round three was T-Bow, as he took him down and just, you know, basically lay on him the whole uh, fight, and, you know, just hit some striking, and Gillard really did nothing. But round one could have gone either way. You know, both guys had their moments in the fight, you know. So that's why I think it's not so much that one. 
my my big gripe was the Edgar Garcia uh, Brad Blackburn fight, which was basically, you know, Garcia in the first round gave him uh, Blackburn basically a snowplow finish, a Hokuto a Hokuto bomb, and you know controlled the did the better effective uh, striking from stand up and you know some better leg kicks. Second round was a stalemate where they were standing, and I just thought you know with Edgar coming or Garcia coming forward and you know having the better of them, you got to give it to Garcia. And then in the third, it was just more of the same of Garcia, you know, dictating the pace and making it his fight. So I scored at 30-27. I was surprised to see two judges go 29-28. Brad, Brad Blackburn definitely Blackburn stole that fight. But anyways, you don't have to worry about seeing any of those on Spike. Um, on Spike tomorrow, definitely if you want to go check them out, you sh for sure should. Um, they started things off with Joe Stevenson versus Nate Diaz. Got to say, Joe Stevenson fought a very smart fight in the fact that when Diaz, well, he shot in on Diaz and he closed the distance. He knew that if he leaves just an inch of an opening, uh, Diaz will grab an arm, grab a leg, and probably throw a submission on you and you may tap. And uh, he kept the fight really close, you know, just, you know, with his wrestling and, you know, enough, you know, the striking and, and uh, submission attempts. You know, he, the thing you have to give Nate Diaz credit, whether you think he's an asshole, you know, whether from his brother or from some of the stuff he's done or just how he talks or whatever you and rhyme or reason is to hate him um i don't i personally like him he's a definite warrior and he proved it here because he got in joe stevenson's guillotine which is the joe's most effective move and maybe the best probably the best guillotine in mma and he just took he got out of that hold like that's impressive he did not tap when it was on really tight um basically that was the rhyme or reason the fight the first it was Stevenson getting the takedown and just controlling, having better positioning, uh, better striking from the ground, and, you know, more submission attempts. Uh, the, the third round, he tried more some more takedowns, couldn't get them, and, you know, that's why you're going to give Diaz the uh, the third round, as he had, you know, good takedown defense, was able to keep the fight standing. Now, he really didn't throw any many strikes or anything like that, but, you know, he had some submission attempts there in the third, that's why he gave the third to Diaz. I scored at 29-28, I believe all the judges did as well. And they did, and it was a Stevenson victory, a victory he needed. And, you know, Diaz looked upset about it, but really, there was nothing Diaz could do. Then we went to the next fight. It was the tough, lightweight final. It was Andre Winter versus Ross Pearson. Really, the one thing I'm going to make note about this fight, it was a basic clinch battle up against the cage. And, you know, because it was in Vegas, and thank God it was, because they've seen their fair share of MMA events now, they understand what's going on and didn't boo it. They didn't cheer the fight, but they didn't boo it, which is a big positive. Um, had this been a fight in a new market, um, if this had you know been the, on like uh, the first show in Montreal or the first show in Ohio, something like that, this would have been booed, and you you know you couldn't complain to the crowd for doing that, but you know gotta give a uh, big thumbs up for not booing it. Yeah, like I said, this fight was basically them in the clinch, and the, like the whole fight was basically that. You know, winner got the more effective uh, striking and battling in the clinch to win the first round. Second round, uh, Pearson threw a nice, you know, knee-strike combination and did more work in the clinch. And the third round, it was more work in the clinch. And then once they broke, um, Pearson threw a nice little flurry to end the round. Tell hurt winner just enough and to win the round, to win the fight. I scored it 29-28 for Pearson. Uh, all judges did as well. And, you know, Pearson won. He definitely deserved it. He cut a nice little interview saying that, you know, it was his mom's 50th birthday and he didn't have a chance to buy her a card or anything. So this was his present to her. So uh, nice to go in there. Don't know how well Pearson will do in the UFC. think he may be better suited for a UFC. But then we went to the next fight, which was Kevin Burns versus Chris Lytle. Uh, this was another good fight. Um, Burns actually surprised me that he won the striking battle in the first round considering Chris Lytle has you know pro boxing experience and more MMA experience he won, he won the first round on striking you know he actually looked like he really hurt Chris Lytle he did, almost did actually could have finished him I just didn't capitalize on that you know some judges scored at 10-8 I didn't I didn't think it was that effective enough to finish him but that's just my my thoughts there um I scored at 10-9 if you scored at 10-8, I could see how you did that. But then Lytle came back. You know, he looked like he was on the brink of defeat, or almost on the brink of defeat. Came back, you know, definitely had more effective striking, uh, better leg kicks, did enough to win the second round. The third round, he cut him open with a mean shot to the face, 
and you know a big cut you know blood was dripping right out of Burns's face it was nasty looking and you know uh, Lionel just chipped away at that to win the round and the fight I scored at 29-28 as uh, I believe every judges did every judge did it as well so the right guy won here um, and it was nice that the judges were making the right calls after what they had done on the undercard the last two on the undercard then we went to the uh, tough welterweight final was Demarcus Johnson versus James Wilkes, the first and all, the only USA versus UK uh, fight on this for the tough on here. Um, really, I just thought Johnson had the wrong game plan. I mean, he tried to take down Wilkes when you know Wilkes was the bigger man, and you know actually got some good uh, takedown defense. I just think it was too big for Johnson to take him down. And then really, you know, it was just better effective striking, and you know Wilkes got on a choke, and that was it. Um, Wilkes looked really impressive. I don't know well how either him or Pearson are going to do in their respective divisions, but we'll see. I mean, obviously now it's going to be Wilkes having to have some really good performances in the UFC to stay there. At least with Ross Pearson, you know, he can move down to the 155 in WEC. Not so much for James Wilkes, but uh, Team UK gets the sweep, and that's, you know, really impressive there. And, um, you know, the UK now continues to be booming with MMA, and now they got more stars that got built up on TV. Then we go to the main event, which was just absolutely an incredible fight. Definitely the best fight UFC's had this year. It was uh, Diego the Nightmare Sanchez versus Clay Guida. Excellent fight. I mean, if you saw them at the weigh-ins with their stare-down intensity, they're trash-talking in the cage before the instructions, and then their stare-down during the instructions, this was awesome. I mean, the first 30 seconds, it was like Pry in Pry 21, uh, Fry versus Takayama, just slugfest, and Diego got definitely the better of it, cut him away badly, like probably broke his nose. Um, and, you know, it's just sort of like Clay's going to be done. Clay got a takedown, you know, just to save him in the fight. And, you know, he was able to control there, but Diego got back up. And then, you know, just uh, kept, kept chipping away with some nice striking. Then J Ro Josh Rosenthal had to step in to fix uh, Guida's mouthpiece. And thank the Lord he did, because after that, Sanchez threw the Scarecrow Crow Cop head kick that absolutely rocked Guida. You'd think this could have been over right then and there. Guida hung on. I can for sure see how you scored this one a 10-8. Um, second round, it was just, you know, Guida getting a takedown and, you know, controlling. He did effective, and not that effective striking, but effective enough. Diego, I made, you know, a comment in my prediction video, really doesn't get that well off his back. Sure as hell did with some effective elbows to the top of the head. And there was this great camera shot where Clay was just bleeding all over Diego. That was just, Wow. Uh, this was just incredible. Third round, they kind of slowed down the tempo, but then again, can you really blame them? And, you know, uh, Diego just did enough to win. You know, Clay didn't really get he didn't. I believe he tried to take him, didn't get it, and, you know, got the victory there. Um, I scored this one 29-28 uh, for uh, Diego Sanchez. So this definitely has to put Diego in line for the winner of Florian versus Penn at UFC 101. Overall, both shows are thumbs up. Definitely looking for your feedback of best match, worst match on each respective card. Anyways, that's it for me. I am out. Peace.